Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel, Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start in verse 32. And if you would stand for me for the reading of the word. Very familiar passage. We're about to go to Sunday school, y'all. Amen? Amen. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. What is happening is that the armies are there. David has come. Goliath has called him out. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Finally, verse 37. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. This morning, I want to speak briefly on the subject before the battle begins. Before the battle begins. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that you're in the house. God, I'm thankful that your spirit is already moving. God, I'm thankful that you're going to speak and talk to us today. God, I'm thankful that your word is anointed. So this morning, anoint your servant. Be as if my words were dipped in honey. Come over, turn our thoughts and imaginations of what we think church should be, and throw your weight around in this room. For God, what is a service without you? Holy Spirit, have your way. We pray in the precious name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Before you sit down, high five three people. Tell them I'm excited about your future. We have been in a sermon series we started last month called Battle Ready. Battle Ready. I made it clear, hopefully, last Sunday that we are at war. I've heard sometimes people get under the unction of the Holy Spirit and they've grabbed the microphone and they have declared war on Satan. I want to explain something to you very clearly. If you're just now declaring war on Satan, you are late to the game. The battle happens. The battle's happening, and the battle will continue to happen whether you declare war or not. And that's what we talked about last week. This week, I want to talk to you briefly about before the battle begins. I once heard a story about a football team. They were predicted to win, but suffered an embarrassing loss. And when the key player was interviewed and asked why they lost, he stated that we had lost in the locker room. It wasn't that they had better players. It wasn't that they had better coaches. It wasn't because they had a better game plan. It didn't matter who had home field advantage. It wasn't because who Vegas predicted to be the odds on favorite. No, he said, we lost in the locker room before the game began. Wow. He was speaking.
speaking about the disunity and discord that affected the team. He suggested that before they put their uniforms on, before they stepped on the field, before they even saw their opponent, before the coin was tossed, and before the ball was kicked, we had already lost because we lost before the game begun. Listen to this preacher this morning. You can lose in the locker room. I'll say it one more time. You can lose yeah. in the locker room. Wow. That's not just in the game of football. That's in the game of life. You can be defeated before the game even begins. Yeah. Listen, I'm just going to be real honest with you real early on. How you come out of the battle is typically determined on how you win in it. Wow. Your success in a struggle usually depends upon what you do before the struggle begins. Yeah. Yeah. Your deliverance from a storm can be determined on how you go into the storm. The outcome of the interview is usually set before the interview. The results of the test can be determined before the first question is even asked. That what you bring to the battlefield will determine what happens on the battlefield and how you look coming out of the battlefield. Come on now. Come on. How you begin and how you go in will always determine how you come out. We are talking this morning about a familiar story. The Philistines have come down. This dreaded enemy has come down to challenge the army of God. They sit on opposite sides of the valley of Elah. And instead of The warriors coming out and there being massive loss. The Philistines send out a warrior, a hero, Goliath from Gath. And Goliath puts it simple. Send me your best warrior to fight me. And if he can beat me, will become your servant. But if he can't beat me, you've got to serve us. Goliath, according to the Bible, is six cubits and a span tall. Scholars debate on how actually tall he was, but here's what we know about Goliath. Goliath is big, and he is battle tested. Yeah. He is tall and he carries with him the testimony of Tim. Thousands have fallen at the sword of Goliath. Goliath comes down to the valley of Eli at the same time every day looks up at the armies of Israel and challenges them to send one man who can stand against him. He looks at the children of the living God and says, send me one man who can fight me. Just one. And said to say, not a soldier from the camp of Israel, step up. No one wanted to fight him. No one wanted to stand against someone who was six cubits tall. That was battle tested. That had that kind of reputation. That was until a young boy named David. And we all know the story. David shows up 
says you got to be kidding me. Ain't nobody going to step on the battlefield? I'll go. David grabs five stones, puts one in a slingshot, knocks Goliath down, takes his sword, cuts off his head, and has the victory. However, scholars are baffled on how a rock could take out the lion. How could one pebble that fit inside of a slingshot take down a man who has killed thousands? I suggest to you that the reason scholars are baffled is because they fail to understand that David had more in his arsenal than five rocks in a slingshot. You listen to this preacher this morning. It's not the rocks he found in the valley that won him the victory. But it was some stuff he took to the valley that caused him to win against the lion. Don't miss this. It wasn't that he found. It wasn't what he found when the battle began. But it was his spirit that he brought with him to the battlefield. It was his attitude and his mindset that was within him that brought him the victory before he even stepped foot on the battlefield. Amen. It's not what you have in your hand that will determine what this battle will look like, but what's in your heart. Amen. Wow. You see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Yes, amen. You must have the right heart. You must have the right attitude. You must have the right spirit in your next season, in your next battle, in your next storm. You must have the right stuff in your spirit. Listen to this preacher this morning. If you have the right stuff, you can take down some giants. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Pastor, this giant's beating me. Maybe it's your attitude. Wow. Wow. When you read the text, we notice that David has four conversations with four groups of people. In verse 26, he speaks to the soldiers. In verse 29, he speaks with his brother Eliab. Eliab? Eliab. Eliab. Eliab? Something like that. In verse 32, he speaks with King Saul. And in verse 35, he speaks to the lion. Now, y'all, bear with me. We're we about to have some Bible study. You ready? Amen. You ready? Amen. You ready? Amen. In those four conversations, we uncover the four weapons David had concealed on him that brought him down to the battle, that ultimately won him the battle against the giant he had to face. And I would suggest to you that before you go into the next struggle of your life, that you equip and arm yourself with some spiritual weaponry that will bring you victory in any struggle, that will bring you victory in any circumstance, that will bring you victory in any battle, that will bring you victory in any challenge, that will bring you victory in any sickness, and that can bring you victory in any storm. And if you arm yourself with these four things that David brought down to the battle, You'll find yourself victory in every time. When David shows up to the valley, the soldiers are talking about how big and how bad Goliath is. They're talking about how skilled he is. They're talking about how tall he is. Talking about how powerful his weapons look. They're all talking about Goliath. And they are afraid of fighting him. And the Bible says that while David was down there, Goliath came out to make his challenge. And while the soldiers were talking, about how bad and mean and terrible Goliath is, David says this, what shall be given to the man who kills him? (laughs) 
all the soldiers, the entire army is talking about Goliath. And they're scared of him. Goliath comes and makes his challenge and David just asks such an unusual question. What shall be given to the man who kills him? You see, what distinguished David from all the other men of Israel, and here's the first weapon David had. David had a vision of victory. What distinguished David from all the other men of Israel is that David had a vision of victory for his life that the others around him did not share. When others forecasted failure, when others predicted defeat, when others saw an obstacle that could not be overcome, David looked at the same thing and he saw himself victorious on the other side of the battle. Amen. David did not wonder about the battle. He was wondering what would be the reward when I come out of the battle victorious. Because you see, David had already seen victory. Already claimed victory. Already believing it was going to work in his favor. The battle like the problem. I want to know what the reward is. Amen. In order to fight the challenges of life, you have to have a vision of victory. Yes, the first thing you have to realize to have a vision of victory is that Goliath and this battle isn't something I'm going to. It's something I'm going through. To have a vision of victory is that Goliath and this battle isn't something I'm going to. It's something I'm going through. There's a difference in a mindset that says I'm going to something versus I'm going through something. When we think we're going to it, we think that's our final destination. That is the end of the road. That it's the last chapter. But when in your mind, no matter what the battle is, you tell yourself that this is just something I'm going through then you already begin to see yourself on the other side of whatever it is you're about to challenge in life. Listen to this preacher this morning. I came to this pulpit under the anointing of the Holy Ghost to tell somebody, you will get through this. Amen. You will make it through this. This won't last forever because we serve a God that specializes on carrying us through some things. We don't walk to the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't walk to the fire. We walk through the fire. We walk through hard times. We work through tough situations. We through we live through rough seasons in our life. But if you trust in God, then we serve a God that will bring you out of whatever it is you find yourself in. He brought Moses out of the Red Sea. He brought the children of Israel out of the wilderness. He brought Daniel out of the lion's den. He brought the three Hebrew boys out of the fire. He brought Peter out of prison. He brought Paul out of the storm. He brought Lazarus out of the grave. He brought Jesus out of death. And there's someone here today that is a witness that he brought you out to. And the same God who brought me out then will bring me out now. There's, this is something I'm going through. I'm t- this is just something I'm going through. On the other side, I see myself wiser. On the other side, I see myself happy. On the other side, I see myself better. You have to have a vision of victory. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. There are some times I have to look in the mirror 
and say you're somewhere in the future better than you are today because I had to have a vision of myself I'm going through everything I went through and coming out on the other side more anointed, stronger better, wiser I'm telling you if you can prophesy to yourself and have a vision of victory and see yourself on the other side yes. Verse 28, he begins to speak to his brother Eliab. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to man, and Eliab's anger was aroused against him. He said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left, left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, and you have come down to see the battle. Eliab is negative. Yeah. He literally maligns David's intentions. He mocks David's efforts. He ridicules David's plan. And he belittles David's vision. And he disrespects David's assignment. Wow. Because whenever God is giving you a vision, yeah. the devil sends someone to encourage you. Yes. Wow. Oh, say that. That's good. That's good. Because whenever God is giving you the vision, the devil always sends someone to discourage you. Yes, yes. Because vision and discouragement go hand in hand. There's always someone who wants to tell you that you can't, what you can't do. And always someone who wants to tell you that your motivation isn't right. Or that your plan won't succeed. And, he, and here's the thing that sucks about this. He always uses folk close to you. Oh, yes. Wow. Yes. One more time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He always uses folk yeah. that are the closest to him. Yeah. Notice that when Elam begins to speak, that this is the shortest conversation that David has. David doesn't try to persuade Elia. David doesn't try to explain himself to Elia. David doesn't try to defend his vision to Elia. David doesn't try to convince Eliab to support him. Wow. David understands that when you're about when you're about to go into battle, here's the second weapon. You ready? You have to be selective in who speaks to your spirit. Good. David understood that when you're about to go into battle, you have to be selective in who speaks to your spirit. Wow. That you just can't listen to everybody. Yeah. You can't take advice from everybody. You can't deal with everybody's issues. You can't be persuaded by everybody's opinion. Yeah. Listen to this preacher this morning. Because there are some people who are just not qualified to speak into your spirit when you're about to go into the greatest challenge of your life. There are some folk you just got to know. There's some folk you just got to walk away from. There's some folk you just got to shut your ears to because they're not here to help you. I realized in my young age that I'm just done putting energy into things that ain't giving me energy back. I don't care who you is. Best friend, my mama, my daddy, my brothers, my serving team, I don't care who you are. If you're not going to give me that energy, you ain't getting it back. And I ain't going to try to persuade you of the vision that God had. I just laid the vision out for the church and you either jump on board or you jump off. 
Because there ain't there's some people I just don't want coming to my church. I listen, I, that's rude. I know. <laughs> I get it. Pastor probably shouldn't have said it, but I know it's it. I just don't want anybody having the key city family name because they have the same name. They don't go out and ruin my reputation. Wow. You gotta be selective on who you go to battle with. And notice this, David says to Eliab, what have I done now? The word now lets you know that David knows who he's dealing with. Because if you come to me complaining about something in the church, and I say, what's wrong with you now? That's just my simple way of telling you you complain too much. <laughs> <laughs> that you always have something negative to say. Yeah. That you're always upset about something. When someone says the word now, that means they know you. And that this is more of the same message you always do. David saying, what have I done now? Suggests that Eliab has a problem with David. And here's a little message in a message here. Quick three things, if I may, that disqualify Eli from speaking into David's life. Number one, Eliab was envious of David. Eliab was envious of David. Because when Samuel came and God sent him to the house of Jesse, he, Samuel looked at Eliab and said, you ain't the next king. Go, there has to be somebody else. And God brought a little boy from the back 40. Oh, let's speak to somebody right there. You think you anointed should look one way, but God's looking for somebody in the secret place who knows how to worship him. And if you're in the secret place, God will always call you out of the secret place into the spot. And Eliab was upset that the favor of God had not rested on him, but the favor of God rested on David. Wow. And never underestimate how far jealous folk will go to discourage you when they know that God has favored you. Wow, Eliab. Wow. Never underestimate.